What's up, guys? Welcome to the show. I'm Jordan. I've also got special guest co-host Demi Ramos here. And What's up? Today on the show, we've got The Score. They're an LA via New York rock band. And they are on right now, I believe. Hello. What's up, guys? Do you like my Dodgers mask that's now perpetually attached to my neck? Yeah, it's just part of your being now. It's an extension. I'm gonna take it off now because this is like, you know, it's always just, I forget I have it on all the time. So you guys have, um, you guys have been releasing singles. You've got a new album coming out, Carry On. Really soon, if you're listening to this on August 28th or later, the, the album's out now. Uh, first of all, I wanna talk about the single you did with Travis Barker because it's a cool song and it's also a little bit different than what you guys usually do so tell me about tell me about that track putting that together how that song came together that song was funny to put together because i think you hit the nail on the head um i sent that idea like just the the chorus idea just me playing the guitar and like singing with like a pitched vocal of myself to be done and we got to the studio and started working on it together and then probably after a day we were kind of like this is kind of different than the stuff we've been doing but you know, we never know how like your management or your, your label is going to kind of react to stuff. And everyone was like, hey, this is really cool. You guys should for sure finish it. We were like, oh, and throw it on the album. We have the album was done at that point. We were, were you guys um, initially fans things. of Blink-182? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah of course they were. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, he was, I mean, Blink-182 was like my childhood. It was like, you know, like, your, like fifth grade through Take Off Your Pants and Jackets. I bought all three just to get all three of the, you know the pants and your jacket and the airplane right um, oh yeah yeah the packaging i forgot about that yeah packaging, yeah there's like three different kinds i was like the kid right. that bought all three and had like hurley t-shirts and like the baggy dicky pants and white sock which is ironic now it's like in fashion again to wear like hurley shirts and baggy sh- it's just funny how life works Comes um, back around. Yeah, yeah. yeah that song was different and then he don made a joke about like oh ha, ha, it'd be funny to have travis barker on this like when the song was done and then Lo and behold, our manager kind of laughed. And then we were like, no, no, but you should like ask. <laughs> and I guess he liked the song. So he was like, fuck yeah, let's do it. One thing I really think is interesting about your sound, um, you have this unique approach to your percussion. You don't have a typical, I mean, you, your drummer plays with a kit live, but you don't have like, you know, you don't have a lot of like snare rolls and things like that. You have very like arena ready, you know, really in your face percussion. So tell me about how you developed that sound. Well, how that sound integrates with your guitars and and everything else, the percussion side of it. Well, Eddie and I are, you know, we're, we're studio guys. We love the studio. That's where we feel at home. And, and now we feel at home on stage too, but it didn't start that way. Um, You know, originally when we first started writing music, it was, it was originally for other people. We didn't think that we were going to be writing songs for ourselves. So, um, that's that's sort of like the nucleus of how a lot of these songs get written is is what happens here and uh, i'm i'm filling the like a lot of the traditional producer role but i don't play drums so i i use computers you know i'm originally a jazz pianist i'm i'm great on keys but i don't play guitar or drums so sort of naturally in my attempt to emulate an anthemic rock sound I'm taking different samples and huge claps and big kicks and, and trying to create that energy and, in that sort of different way. And I think that's how we ended up with that sound that you really hear on Legend and a lot of other songs. Is it true one of you guys is a New Yorker? Yeah. Or lived in New York? Uh, okay. Cool. I yeah, well, read yeah. somewhere that you started or you both started to play in a Rockwood Music Hall. Do you guys remember that? Can you yeah, tell yeah. me about a little bit about those days and what's it like to go from Rockwood Music Hall to touring the world? People are like having seizures in the front row. You know what I mean? Tell me all about that. <laughs> seizures <laughs> in the front row. Seriously, have I've seen. Have you been to Rockwood? I've been. Yes, I'm. I'm a New Yorker also, so I go there. Jimmy's for played all the Rockwood time. before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. one of one yeah. of their seven stages. <laughs> yeah. When we started playing, they only had the two. There was like Rockwood Stage One, which is like the little, like the bar that's not even a stage. It's like the door to the entrance opens yeah, onto yeah, the yeah. stage. Yeah. 
and then there was Rockwood Stage 2. And, like, when we originally started the band, I think, like, at the time, I think we thought we, like, wanted to be, like, Maroon 5 meets, like, Fits in the Tantrum. So we had, like, a horn section. And, wow. like, we all, couldn't fit, we all couldn't fit on stage. It was, like... After it, the band was off the stage. Yeah, it was hilarious. And then, and then we progressed. But, you know, because we were a lot... We, we were, you know, 24, 23 at the time. And, like, for us, it was just fun because you'd be like, fuck, yeah, you get to go and play a show in New York and Lower East Side. And then you just get, like, drunk afterwards. And it was, like... So we kept doing that, like, you know, once a month, try to play. And then we progress to stage two. And then it's funny just thinking about now that when we go to New York and it's like, damn, like we've literally played places in Europe where we're playing for like 5,000 people at a festival. Our own shows, like 1,500 people sold out, you know, and it's funny just to know where we started and like where our roots were in New York and very humble and playing these little shows where it was like basically a completely different band. And we've grown so much in, you know, like the seven years since we've been performing. To, I mean, it's been, it's been a wild ride and it's still a wild ride. And then Corona What's, kind of halted that for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's interesting about your, your, you talk about the evolution of your sound, the song that kind of puts you on the map, Oh My Love, sounds really different now compared to what you're releasing. Like, how do you feel about that song five, six years later? We don't like listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's like, funny. Yeah, tell me, yeah, tell you get the fans who find like the deep cuts. Oh man! And yeah. and they and it sucks because they go up to you after stage like, "Why didn't you play All My Love? That's my favorite song." It's Don's mom We're talking like, about that, by the way. Don's <laughs> mom's always like, "Play All My Love." Yeah, it's pro- it is that's kind of like your that's almost like an adult contemporary, you know. Oh, that is hot AC yeah. all the way. Very there mom friendly. Very mom friendly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, it's like when we did that song we were still we still hadn't really had our chops live yet like we had just moved to LA from New York and we weren't playing a ton and I think we were still trying to figure out who we were as a band and that song just kind of through the universe just kind of like randomly caught fire in the UK through a commercial and then it was this whirlwind for us where it was like oh shit there's record labels now and we have to kind of chase the sounds but like I don't think that sound was ever authentically done in myself and like what the band wanted to be it was a process of us having to chase that so I mean we'll be forever grateful because we have a career and we have you know yeah. fans and we can make a living doing this um but I mean I don't think that's that song was representative of who we are as a band today but you know it got us our foot in the door so that's all we could ask for when you when you got signed and you had your you know you you could put together more music you had a little bit of of support to to make your music how did you start with like if if oh my love wasn't what you wanted to sound like how did you move forward and create the sound that you wanted to make yeah i mean i we we did all my love we we put out a few other songs too that were sort of in an indie pop slash hot ac vein yeah yeah and and I like to, I like to use the word the term hot AC. Yeah, I know yeah, it's so it's cringe. The whole radio, whole radio. It's so cringe. Yeah, it's so industry. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, I guess Oh My Love didn't really take off in the U.S. like it did in the U.K. And that it was kind of this weird moment where everything came to a halt for us. So you could start fresh in the U.S. Like you could almost have like a- Yeah, because it, that song didn't make a big enough impact that people even really knew who we were. Right. So we still had the chance to start over again, but now we were had a great record deal, like a, a nice one because we had proven, you know, we had leverage when we, when we had that first song and we have the support of a great label and their mm-hmm. team. So it was kind of a unique position to start fresh with all these resources. Yeah, and then and that song not working was the best thing for us in our career, um, wow. at least here because we didn't know who we were as a band yet, and we went through two EPs where we still didn't know like what the fuck we were doing. We were chasing sounds and trying to figure out like, no, we're like this and we're like this and we're like this. So family sometimes can be the best thing that happens to you. So it really had it forced us to buckle down and like hunker down in our studio and figure out okay, shit, like we should throw guitars in and like maybe sound more like a rock band and make these songs that are just universal and not like a typical love song that pop bands are doing, just something a little different. And it just seemed to resonate. Like in a lot of the songs on that first album we put out that have done so well, it was like our backs were literally against our wall, like against the wall because we knew the trajectory for most bands. If you don't kind of make it off the bat, you kind of get dropped. And then, um, so I think a lot of that, a lot of that music was written like out of desperation and just trying to figure out, 
who we were as a band and what we wanted to be. Thank you for actually talking about that because I feel like a lot of people, their favorite bands, a lot of your, your fans don't know that actually, you know, there were, there's levels to your journey and, you know, there, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that it's really helpful for your fans to know, like, you know, you guys just weren't some like, out of nowhere like you guys had a long road and you came a long way and now you're fucking rock stars and it's awesome and i want to know about do you remember your first tour do you remember your first tour i hear nightmare stories about um people's first tours like their are in tiny vans our like, our, yeah our first legitimate tour was blue, was, blue was blue october yeah that was you know it's funny when you do things again where you don't realize how like momentous it is and how much of a growing experience it is until like in hindsight it's 2020 um, you know, Blow October, they've been around for like, you know, two decades, you know, they had hits back in the early 2000s. And so for us, when they asked us to go on tour, we were like, okay, I guess we, we need to learn how to play live. And I don't think we were fans of the music then of, of Blue October. And then just meeting those guys on tour, they're like the nicest human beings. It's so humble. These shows, they could go to anywhere in the country, any night, and there'd be 1500 people there. And they would do these crazy meet and greets and seeing their business was like, well, this is like a legitimate business. And at least for me, those guys at the time weren't really on the radio, but it showed that you can make like a full blown career, just, you know, touring and being, having an awesome live show and just constantly putting music out and interacting with the fans. It kind of expanded, I think. And I think that kind of harkens back to the whole hot AC thing. That's yeah. so, and the reason why it's so cringy is that like industry often looks at bands are like, okay, who are they like? What lane do they fit in? Yeah. Okay, if they fit in this lane, then they can be considered part of the cool kids because there's an opportunity through radio that's going to allow them to give them the rocket ship to go yeah. all the way. You know what I mean? And, and we've learned that it's best not to focus on that. And instead, and what Blue October showed us was that they yeah. didn't focus on that. They focused on their fans. They focused on the community that they were building and feeding that community. Mm -hmm. um, and then this world kind of takes on a life of its own. And we saw that for the first time in October. And now we try to emulate that ourselves. Yeah. We, we've been advice. on tours after that. We've been on tours after that where the bands have had stuff like uh, people that we know or shows we'll see or bands we'll tour with have stuff at radio. And there's like sometimes not that many people at the show. And then you, you're at Blue October and it's like they haven't had a song on the radio at the time for years and they have these like 1500 people like at the show packed sold out and it's like a religion for them yeah it's like like a, VIP. It's, it's just yeah it was it, it was nuts it was like the best learning experience for us tour wise so you guys are meant to be you know you have courses that are catchy that are meant to be sung along with songs that are meant to be played on the radio you have the stuff in movies and, and commercials when you guys are writing songs how much do you think about, you know, this is something the fans can sing along to. This is something that would be good in a movie. How much, how conscious are you, especially now that you've had placements in movies and TV shows, when you're writing music, how conscious are you of it, of how it will be digested by the public? Uh, we used to be more conscious of that. Um, when we cared about, when we cared about like really trying to like chase radio and chase this, whatever. But I mean, we've built a career and we have fans now i think just because we've been authentic to us so we write in volume and we're always we're always in the studio doing stuff i mean there's certain songs we know that when we do it we're like oh shit this is this would sound like amazing in a movie or you know tv show but we don't write specifically to like okay we're going to the studio today to write a hit for its sync it's gonna you know we don't go and do that um but i mean yeah i mean we'd be lying if we said there's not a moment where we're thinking about like, oh, this could work great for like this trailer or work for this, but we don't go in thinking like that. Yeah, I mean, cinematic, write, cinematic is a good way to describe your music. Your music is cinematic. Yeah, a lot of I mean, it, it, it's big sounding for sure. I mean, there's big ass drums that you know, I was talking about earlier. There's guitars, there's these soaring choruses and stuff. But I think that's the kind of band we kind of wanted to be. And I think that industry just kind of, um, with sync and film and tv it just kind of liked the stuff we were doing but we never went into it thinking like this is great for tv or for you know for film one thing about success right um which you which which you guys clearly have um done in your career um you start putting out music you're blowing up how did things start to change in your personal life 
Yeah, I mean, things change. I mean, people grow. Eddie and I have been working together for, what, nine years, eight or nine years since mm -hmm. we met each other. People, it's like, in a lot of ways, it's like a marriage. It's, it's a partnership, and we see each other every day, and, and we're human beings, and we're changing. As we're getting older, we're maturing, and, and you kind of... And then there's also the whole aspect of, of, of the music and the business and how the business is changing. And there's just like a lot happening. So um, for sure. And then, you know, obviously like I, I got engaged slash I'm sort of married right Congratulations. now. Congratulations. I'm like civilly, I'm civilly yes. married, but we haven't had like the actual ceremony yet because of coronavirus, which sucks. Um, and I, obviously Eddie's in a serious relationship. So, so like, you know, in the beginning, we were like two 22 or 23 year olds who were like going to the club every, every weekend, you know, you know, trying to meet girls and do music and take over the world. You know what I mean? And like, Hey, we're in a band. Our shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? But then, but then you, you know, you get into a serious relationship and then you buy a house and then, yeah. So things, things change, but um, you know, you gotta just have to be flexible and communicate well and, yeah, it's like a marriage in that way. Why are you guys good as a duo? What makes your person personality wise, musically, why do you guys work together well? What drew you together? I think because we're different um, and we have different strengths uh, that complement each other. Uh, like Idan is very technical and he's like an amazing jazz musician. Um, I am not technical. I, I grew up on like rock and roll and like punk rock. Um, and I'm a little more boisterous and extroverted. Um, so I think just, I think our personalities and just the, um, the way we think about music just complement each other because we can fill certain voids that each other have. And it's just, it's just worked for the past eight or nine years. And Eddie, what's your, what's your vocally, where are you coming from when you started? How long have you been singing like in bands since high school or? Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, the whole thing where you, like, watch Blink-182 videos on, I don't even know if it was YouTube, but I had the, you guys, you guys know, like, drive Through Records? Yeah, like, yeah. New, I, New Found I, Glory and stuff was on drive Through, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, so I used to have, like, the drive Through Records, like, DVDs, this is, like, before there was, like, YouTube and all that stuff. Were you a Warped you Tour would, kid? Did you go to Warped Tour a lot? Oh, yeah, I went to Warped Tour, I had, like, a really, I was, like, this awkward like skinny kid wearing like dicky shorts with a spike belt and like high white socks and like oh, curly yeah. t-shirts going he to out a hot topic yeah yeah 100 percent out of, everything was bought a hot topic everything <laughs> was and now it's fashion now just like this um yeah. but yeah you know and then you just i i grew as a singer just trying to imitate bands that i liked so i went through this really bad period where i sounded like a scene band it's like in your nose in your nose like like this singing like this you know and right um i don't know i think the more i just kind of listened to a bunch of rock stuff i kind of found where i wanted to sound like and what i wanted to be so how was you, how did you go from whiny emo kid to arena rock voice uh <laughs> probably not being successful being the emo whiny kid and then <laughs> trying to having to find something else out i mean but like i grew up on like the rolling stones and zeppelin stuff so that stuff was always resonated with me um so I think just kind of trying to sing along with those records after the, the horrible emo phase. Um, I think that's kind of what shapes like what I sound like now. My light just went out, but that's okay. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> if I were a fly in the wall in the studio with you two, what does your songwriting process look like? Who starts? You know what I mean? And the production. I'm interested wow. in the production as well. Like, because there's two of you, but you have such a big sound on your albums, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. how that, how that works. Yeah, uh, Eddie. Eddie usually starts. He come. It, it's it's something about the fact that it's Eddie. Eddie's vocal is the like the main piece, the main instrument that that is disseminating this on our record. So it has to sit well on his voice. So we find that it's easiest that the initial idea comes from him, and it feels most authentic and kind of jives that way. So he'll come to me with like a, a verse idea or a verse and chorus idea on guitar that sounds good just by itself. You know what I mean? Like without any beats or anything, uh, just on guitar or piano. And then I'll be like, okay, um, I'll be behind the computer 
and I'll be like, okay, uh, what could be the beat that goes underneath this kind of vibe? What, uh, maybe you try changing these chords. Do you try this chord progression instead? Like my, the way my brain works is like, I see like a million different options. And then I'm like, okay, let's pull out this option. Does, let's try this out. Let's try it. You know what I mean? And then Eddie's like, oh, I didn't even think of that. Okay, cool. Oh, this is better. Uh, and then, and then we keep adding pieces together. And Eddie pulls out his guitar and he try he tries different ideas on guitar. So he's also working on the production together with us. And then, and then maybe there's a, a, a piece missing from the chorus that's like needs like some catchy post hook or something. And I'll start singing something. And Eddie will grab that and go, oh, that was actually good. Can you, you know, let, let me try something like that. And he'll get behind the mic and try. So it's, it's like a back and forth in that way. You're releasing this album, obviously it's a strange time. Did you did you write and produce this album? You know, last fall and the. Tell me about the the writing process, the production process, specifically for Carry On. No, I mean a lot of the songs were written. I'd say like maybe two thirds of the album was probably written before coronavirus. It was like a lot of the bigger songs were written before. I mean, like I mean bigger. I mean bigger sounding songs were written uh, before coronavirus is because we had the opportunity to tour and go all over the world and kind of seeing like what worked for us at a live show. We really wanted to encapsulate that into the neck, into this album, Carry On. Um, a few of the songs happened during coronavirus. Uh, I think because we just, there was no touring, we had a lot more times on our hands and we had to finish this album. Um, so some of the songs that are on there that are a little more, not somber, but I think a little more organic sounding um it gives us time to take a step back and we're like cool let's try like real drums or let's try just like a strip song you know kind of just starting with the piano and acoustic guitar which we never do um but yeah i mean it was written over the course of a couple years how do you think it compares to the other uh the album and your your eps that you released in terms of the sound I think we we made a conscious decision to move in a more organic yeah. live direction um you know like i said mentioned earlier since i'm like a keyboard player and i'm very technical um i my resting place is kind of in that zone which is what we were doing before and i think we wanted to take us out of our comfort zone on this record and and work with drummers live drummers work you know work with other producers who can kind of help us get that perfect mesh of those two worlds right and then, yeah, I think in also we, the first album we put out, uh, Atlas, did so well for us. And we, as our second album, our sophomore album, didn't want to just do the same thing all over again. Um, so it's this constant dichotomy and like walking a line of we want to put out songs that we know like our hardcore score fans are going to love and still, you know, be authentic to them. But then we also want to show growth and evolution as, as to be like, you know, fuck, we've played festivals, you know, for 5,000 people in Europe, like on main stages, like we want to incorporate some of the live stuff into the new music and just sound more yeah. like a, a band. Because if you hear us live, we, we have more of that traditional rock and like live drum sound. Yeah. It's, Speaking it's a of bit band. Different. Um, you guys have not only like pop elements in your music, there's a lot of rock elements too. And like you said, you're playing live with band. So what do you guys, how do you feel about the comeback of rock music? Right now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like do you think it's happening? Rock. Is it happening? I feel like, like rock in terms of the, like the, uh, the current trends and, and the public, you know, cultural awareness of rock has kind of receded a little bit. But do you feel like it's maybe bouncing back a little bit? I think the attitude, the alternative attitude is coming to the forefront through the meshing of genres. So you, you get an alternative attitude, um, I guess, uh, uh, being meshed with hip hop. Uh, I'm trying to think of examples of artists. I mean, like if you think of like, uh, like Juice World, you think mm. of, uh, I mean, like RIP, like Billie Eilish. There's a bunch of these, yeah. <clears throat> there was an era in mainstream pop music where it was like the Dr. Luke, Max Martin era where yes. everything was like precise and was like almost like formulaic. Swedish pop. Um, yeah, Swedish pop. And I think now there has been a conscious shift to kind of just like fuck it. And it's just kind of messy sometimes is better. And you're mixing genres. Like Billie Eilish sounds like almost like a, like a jazz singer, like with her voice, but it's like hip hop beats under it. You have Juice World is doing like legit, sounds like emo rock with like hip hop drums. Um, yeah. 
and the weekend I, is also mix like is a, another good example of mixing yeah. genres yeah the weekend i mean like dominic I, fike is yeah, another one dominic i mean he's fike. played on alternative radio which was a traditionally a, a radio format that was only for rock bands you yeah. know yeah. but it's because he's bringing i mean i guess he's combining it also with r&b but but there and young blood is another example of somebody that bring that alternative attitude or that punk that punk vibe to other yeah. genres Speaking of genres what would you describe your sound as i hear so many different things from so many different people and how much know. do you hate that question or the idea of trying to label yourself? A lot. I hate, we always we hate, hate both question. of your questions, guys. You <laughs> I don't know. It's like for, at least for me personally, I, I would call it like, just like anthemic, like anthemic rock, but it's not like anthemic rock in the age of 2020, not mm -hmm. like we're yeah. trying to like be like stadium rock, modern kind of version. MP, you know, it's not like that type of stuff, but it's also, we're not like the most alternative thing out, you know, out there. It's like something you could turn on in your car and be like, holy fuck, I'm pumped up. Something you can lift to, like lift weights to. Something you can, you could be, you imagine yourself at an arena, like with all the black, you know, the speakers. We, we had another interview and, and we settled on with that interviewer. We were like talking about it and he was like, who fighters in the age of Kanye? Oh yeah, we started. <laughs> and we were like, that actually makes sense. I mean, it does make sense. Yeah. It's a really little bit like, sense. there's like some black skin head drums with, uh, yeah. You guys are big. I've, you talked about uh, that you broke out in, in England, UK. Oh, my love was in the, the commercial, and that's how you got the ball rolling over there. And you guys are have a planned, really ambitious European tour for the spring. How do you feel about the likeliness of that tour going forward? Uh, we were like taking bets on on what's the chance of that that will come through. Yeah, maybe it's like uh, I think it's like. 60 40 that it's not going to happen i don't want to say that no. though we can't <laughs> i probably can't say that to um i don't know it, it really depends on on what happens we we only want to perform when it's safe to perform um we don't want to put our our fans at risk um in, and health wise in any way um you know obviously we can't wait to get over there we were literally on the in the middle of a tour when the travel ban happened the u.s travel ban happened so yeah we we're really back. pissed. Like we want to be out there. We want to be playing for all of our fans, but we got to be responsible at the same time. I think we put it out as February, kind of put like a good energy vibe. Like, yeah, yeah. it's going to happen, yeah. you know, and we'll see yeah. what happens. Hopefully we don't have to postpone. Yeah. So we're just crossing our fingers. Hope it works yeah. Out. Cause, cause your music is meant, you talk about you, you guys are studio guides, but your music is really like meant for an audience. Like you, like those oh, kind of songs. Yeah. Yeah, no, you feel you feel at the live show, especially in Europe, because I mean, Europe. I think they're so much more responsive to uh, a American bands, but just like to flat out like to rock music. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason, it's a cultural thing, and yeah, when we play live shows, it's like when, if you're just in the audience, whether it's in America or Europe or Asia or whatever. I think the songs make more sense. And you're kind of like, oh, okay. Like I 100% get it now. Like it's you if, you, if you didn't leave with like your chest not vibrating and your ears kind of like making a ringing sound, then like we didn't do the job. We want to make you deaf. Yeah. How would you compare your, the, your, the audiences in Europe versus the audiences in America? You mentioned the, the cultural difference there. It just more. I mean, it depends in America. It's, it depends it, where in America too. Where, yeah. America's so diverse culturally. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, are you guys in LA? Where are you guys? We're in. We're in Brooklyn. You're in Brooklyn. Yeah. Okay. So like, yeah. So we've done like the Knitting Factory. We've done a bunch of venues in New York. Uh, New York for us is always a fun show because it's kind of like a homecoming of sorts. Um, it's fun. But like, you guys kind of know the vibe when you go to shows in New York. Everyone's kind of like they're you know they're kind of arms yeah. crossed, uh -huh. kind yeah. of slow nod, you know, whatever. And it's like, oh, it's, it's, you're cool, but you're not like my morning jacket or whatever. Like, it's fine. William's and, <laughs> nope. Yeah, you know, you know what I mean? But it's like, that's kind of the same thing with LA. But then you go to like to Chicago or you go to Nashville, Tennessee. I mean, what's a better example? Texas and like St. Louis. And Ohio. Like Ohio, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, it's like the fans like go off there. It's because like they're going to the show. There aren't a bunch of other tours and bands in town. They're not trying to look cool in the way. Yeah, there's zero, yeah. zero fucks about trying to look cool. They're trying to drink like PBR and like rock out, uh, you know, rock out yeah. music. Yeah, and um, they're totally going to go out after the show and like get some McDonald's 
at the drive through at 2 a.m. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like most of Europe is like that. A few exceptions, most of Europe is kind of like that mentality, right? Like, we're yeah. Still- I mean, we have, I, we have yet to play in Paris. We'll see about how that is. That's- um, but, uh, yeah, I feel like Europe, I don't know what it is. Yeah. It just hits different. Just hits different. You do this collaboration. You've done, you did the collaboration Black Bear and you got the Travis Parker thing. Who else, what kind of collaborations would you like to do in the future? Dream collab. Uh, yeah, someone not in a genre that we're in, like something that, something that would be cool. Um, I don't know, like Post Malone would be amazing because he kind of toes, he toes that line of like yeah. stuff with Ozzy Osbourne, but then he puts out stuff with, you know, um, like the baby. I don't know. He just, that, that, I think that would be awesome. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Everyone How did you feel about it. the Post Malone Nirvana covers? Did you see them? I didn't see them. Did you catch that? No. no. I did not catch it. Was it good? But I'm sure they were great. He's actually a good. He's actually a. He's actually a really good guitar player. And, and people always forget that like he started off in like pop punk bands in Texas before he was like Post Malone. So I mean, he he kind of has that background. He's a huge like rock fan. So like yeah. I appreciate that. So what are you guys doing? You guys are doing a, like a, a live concert to promote the release of the album. Is that correct? We are from the Belly Up in San Diego. So it'll be at a music venue. And we're but punks. with no, but with no one there, with no one, just there. virtually. They're, they'll be there virtually, virtually in spirit. Virtually in spirit, but uh, that's kind of a cool idea. So you're doing like a full stage show, almost like the way that uh, that baseball teams are playing for empty stadiums. You're kind of like doing like the rock equivalent of that. Yeah, God, you yeah. made it sound so much more depressing now. Though I'm gonna, I, I just thought about <laughs> that. dude. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put a crowd applause sample on my on some my like pad. We get some yeah, I'm gonna hit. It. After every song, I'll be like, applaud, applaud. Yeah, you can uh, have like the fans could like get projected like the virtual fans in the at the basement. Like in the NBA, like like yeah. the NBA, what they're doing. Oh, yeah, my, oh my exactly, God. exactly. It's be hilarious. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. But yeah, we're excited. I mean, it'll be the first time our fans are hearing this, this new music, quote unquote, live. And then, you know, we'll, it'll be our first time playing it for an audience, virtual or not, you know. So we're, we're, we're really excited to kind of share that moment with, the fans and and to be honest like it is kind of like a once in a lifetime thing because i don't this corona thing was obviously unexpected but in most cases we would be on the road you know and be playing in front of a show with people or having a tour behind it so it's a, it's a little different experience but i mean it's, it'll be one to remember i guess that's like the flips the bright side positive yeah yeah you won't forget it that's true that's true <laughs> There's a lot right. of youngsters that listen to this show, and I just I want to know what would you guys tell your 16 year old selves about knowing what you know now. I feel like you stole my question from our, from our. We do a thing on YouTube the past few weeks called Keeping Score, and we interview like uh, our different bands that are our friends, like the Unlucky Candidates and um, Cemetery Son, and we end every episode asking them the exact same question. So now you, you guys get to answer. <laughs> now we get to answer. Yeah, I would, I would say, um, I would say just to, to real. I think when I think of myself when I was young, it was like every little thing mattered. Like, like I would show my music to an A and R, and I'd be like, "What did he think?" And if he didn't like it, it would be like, "Oh no, the world's falling apart." Or if he did like it and he was gonna pitch it for an opportunity, I was like, "That's it. We're gonna be number one Billboard artists. This is it. Our, our life is taking off." when you look back at it after all this time, you realize how silly that was. Um, there's a lot, it, like, I think for doing this music thing is really a roller coaster of emotions and you have to learn how to take everything with a grain of salt, listen, but also take everything with a grain of salt and think about the bigger picture. Don't think about what's going to happen next month or next week. Think about what's going to, where you're going to be at five years from now. And then when you are there five years from now, it may feel like, you know, in the moment, it may feel like you're not making much progress. But if Eddie and I were to look back five years and think about where we are now compared to then, I mean, the, f- the five-year younger version of myself would be so ecstatic with where we are. So just remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I think yeah. it's, in- I think it's, go ahead, Eddie. Yeah, and then you asked if you were like 16, right? Like you're telling your 16-year-old self what to do? Yeah. Um, yeah, like my 16 year old self was the kid playing like pop punk bands, like playing at venues, like the whole, you know, like that was my whole thing. I was also playing football and doing all these sports. I don't think I would have changed 
a thing. I think the only thing I would have done is just told my 16 year old self that you're going to hear no a lot and that your timeline of when you think you're going to make it might not be the timeline you have in mind. But like, if you really love something and you really are committed to it, you're going to find a way to make it happen, like regardless. But uh, yeah, the advice I would have just given to myself would have just been, you're going to hear no a lot and just let the no, like all the no's you have, just let that be, you know, fuel and really drive you because you can either just like take a back seat and like, that's it, you know, or you can, you know, really just try to, prove people wrong and prove to yourself that you know you can you can do this you should be doing this and you have to make stuff like that's how you went from emo warp tour kid to rock singer like you are now is you yeah. had to you had to, to work your way through that you had to yeah, keep you singing to, yeah you have to go out there when there's like you know five people in the audience and your mom and dad are like or you know two of them you have to go play the like the open mic nights in New York City when like you're 19, you know, like at like really bad venues in Lower East Side, like you have to do all of this stuff because it just makes you better. And at the end of the day, it really makes you appreciate like once you get there, like what you've done to get there and it kind of makes you appreciate like the journey as a whole. Did you ever play, did you ever play Cake Shop? Cake Shop? Yes, Yes. we did. With the red light? Yeah. So tiny, so tiny. So yeah, tough, so narrow. It's so funny. We had this co- us, we had this conversation with our bandmates like the other day. We were just like, "Why did we play?" I was mean, like, "We played all those tiny little Lower East Side Marlins, venues. Pianos. Why? Why did we do that? Like, why did we put ourselves through that?" And then we kind of like all said, "Like, well, it brought us from point A to point B. Maybe it wasn't yeah. the most efficient way to do it, but it was our journey, and that's how it went. And you just got to be like." That's part of the process. So mo- moving and to LA was really like the key for you guys to break out was going, was leaving New York. Yeah, no, we came out there for, we were in New York and we came out to LA for like a writing trip just to, to do it. Cause a bunch of friends had been there. And when we got back, like I totally Donna, cause I, I grew up in Orange County, um, which is like 40 minutes from LA. And we were both talking and I was like, yo, I'm for sure. Like my lease is up for my apartment. Like I'm, I'm going to LA your job can transfer to LA. I think we should just like move to LA. Cause at that time it was like, there was a few people left in New York, but you could see the writing on the wall that like everyone LA was going to be the center of the creatives. Um, I, I mean, literally once we moved less than a year later, we were signed. So I think that was the best choice we could have made. Yeah. Why, what, what the decision to, to sign with, with a big, with a well-known record label, where did that come from? Was did you get did you get courted by other labels or how did you end up on Republic? Yeah, we oh, did get courted. We oh, had man. we had offers in from every label because <laughs> because we had a song that was a rocket ship out of the UK. It was the the most synced song in the UK. Uh, it was it was the most it was in the it was like the most Shazam yeah, the most song, Shazam song yeah. in the UK for that for that year. So we were we it was like this weird thing where everybody has like i guess all these labels have like researchers and stuff who are like looking at metrics scouts yeah, mm-hmm. yeah exactly and like we were like hitting the alarm on every single like for every single label so they were all reaching out to us um uh we, we could write a book on the, that literally the experience it's like it's so funny it's like all the stereotypical stories you hear about like butch walker put a book out like 10 years ago about his experience being bands and like all these a and from different labels go from like literally some of the people that were taking out to dinner had told us no like five months ago when yeah. they had heard the song. They heard the exact same song, yeah. said no, <laughs> said no thanks, not for us. Yeah. And then when it took off in that commercial, they were like, oh, we want to sign it. Yeah. And then five months later, it's like we're at like Boa Steakhouse, we're at Soho House, we're at like all these expensive, at, we're at fucking- Black cars, we're limos. We're at in New York. We're at like, yeah, everything. Yeah, we're being picked up in limos and- I can just, I can just picture like A and R people on their cell phone, like these guys, these two guys. They they've got great hair, they've got great songs. <laughs> They're like, let's sign them, let's go, guys. Yeah, I have a quick game I want to play for the fans. This is this is called Question for the Fans. Da, 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 dee, 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 dee. Okay, real quick, just answer the both of you if you can at the same time. Leather or denim? Leather. Trapped on an island with Britney Spears or J Lo. J Lo, mm-hmm. country or classical? Country. New York or L A? New York. L A. Converse or Vans? 
Converse. <laughs> oh, okay. Blondes or brunettes? Brunettes. Oh. <laughs> That's a tricky one because we we're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, what? What? What's the hair color of your significant others? <laughs> like For my us. girlfriend's hair color is okay. <laughs> I feel like that was a whole trick sequence just to get us that last question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Way to go, Demi. Way to go. Thanks for playing. Way to go. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll we'll let you go. Thank you so much for your time and good luck with the new album. And I hope the tour works out. Thanks Thank so you much. too. We Thank as well. You. Thank you. Fun. You guys take care. It's real with Jordan Edwards. It's presented by Pop Dust. Go to popdust.com for the latest in pop culture, music, and entertainment. And you can find me at jordanedwardsstudio.com or on Instagram at jordanedwardsstudio. And Demi is at. Where you at, Demi? Demi underscore Ramos, Instagram. Instagram. Yes. You know where it is. All right. Thanks, guys, for listening. Thank you.